and the vintage film is with us again. This year, we start with the light car rally in the Cotswolds. June the 7th is the date. In the middle of a very hot and delightful vintage motoring summer. Most people were concerned with maps, but Ian, Ian Walker and Jane were much more concerned with a little competition to see how much they could get into their Austin 7 chummy. John Rowley with the Schneider. And there's Clive Hamilton Gould with the Citroen. Seemed to be quite a lot of differences of opinion as to which way one went at certain intersections. seem to be splitting the difference between two parts of a crossroads. There's the Austin 7 with enough luggage to last a month. Another Austin 7, this time with a lady drying her nail varnish. It's Pat Marsh with his wife in the Austin 7. Ah, oh, there's Rowley still at it. He's tried two of the different directions, he's only one left. Salmson, Ian Maxwell's motor car this. Ah, oh, there's Rowley. I think this time he's probably got it right. Maxwell again. This was a real day for tourers, sort of day when you could really do with a bit of a paddle. And that's exactly what the competitors got. Talbot of Brenda Rowley. Seemed a very strange place to have a Marshall point, but at least the Marshalls take cold. Up to the knees anyway.
Bertrand looks happy, but he, little does he know that he's actually arrived from the wrong side. This causes a certain confusion with the marshal, who has expected him to come from the other direction, where a more modern Citroen was creeping out of the way. It's very useful to have a boat-tailed type of motor car in these conditions. He's got the thing going astern anyway. Ah, the Schneider finally made it. And we made it to the next venue. This is Madras Field for the driving tests. There's Mrs. Shaw, John Shaw's Merendas. Are there for some of the um, marshals? In fact, it was more serious than that because they were the judges for the concours. And I suppose by halfway through the afternoon, some of the cars were beginning to look a bit blurred. But this wasn't true of Neil's ghost, which looked absolutely impeccable. And in fact, won the concourse part of the Madras Field event. There goes the bar again. Supposed to be keeping out the um, cold weather. At least that's what Brian Morgan claimed. Brian Luscott Evans. He was clerk of the course. And with all that rain about, this was not too easy a task. Though they're not actually playing bears, what they're trying to do is to line up some posts so that the competitors can come and knock them all to hell. It's a sort of nesting process which um, involves a tin and a half of Dulux. That was Felix Day in the Fraser Nash that took one of the posts away. I think that must be two faults. I don't think that's his opinion of the cameraman. At times there was more lining up than driving. But then the competitors insisted on banging the posts about every time. This was a width judging at the end of the game to see just how close you came to the curb. Some got a little further than others. 
and some forgot that in fact you'd got hubcaps on a 3098 and the ears tended to knock over the posts. That's night in the mirror. And the club's president, Bernard Kane, comes to make certain that all the posts are properly fixed to the ground. Just to show how close you can get, you can touch a post and it won't go over. The test here was a go slow, and then when you crossed the line, as fast as you could for the second half of the test. Opinions were evenly divided as to whether it was more difficult to go slowly or to go quickly. Julian Gosch seems to have got the answer here. He hasn't got either foot on the accelerator. Freddie Giles having to go somewhat unaccustomedly slow in the Fraser Nash. And Wing Commander Buckle, a new system, see if you can carry a mug of beer, preferably full, on the back hood of the motor car. Freddie Giles, who was down to drive the Cognac Special, was full of the joys of spring. He'd also brought a few little spares with him. Looked like a frozen eel, but somebody said it was a half shaft. But I didn't know those cars had them. And the Austin 7 folk were still writhing away at the front of it. There's the Type 59 Bugatti, side starting. And Bill Morris's ERA, just finding its wheels. Freddie Giles has still got that strange piece of wrapped fish. And Nigel Arnold Forster conducts the driver's briefing. Marshals were well catered for, they even had a special little bog attached to their hut. But the drivers were away on the vintage seamen. And first time down into Old Hall Corner, the Bentley Napier led with Peter Morley in command.
down into the new bend called Foster's, which drivers were finding a little bit difficult on the shortened course, and round to Lodge, where the Bentley was leading Kane in the Bugatti, followed by the Bernardo Hassan with Keith Schellenberg. And there's the Cognac Special. Cognac Special today was being driven by Freddie Giles, who was being bullied a bit by another giant machine two inches behind him. The Monato Hassan making a rare appearance and going very well indeed. Straker Squire, that's Adrian Liddell, who seems to have got things all messed up at Lodge. But Freddie Giles too was to have trouble. He fetched a sump plug out, trying to avoid another motor car in an accident. And all the oil ran away, and that was the end of his race. Bernard Kane won the vintage seaman. But this was no consolation to Freddie Giles, left out in the countryside with no oil in the sump. The car he avoided was the Bentley Napier, which had completely shed a wheel at the hub. Just a few spokes. Nicholas Franco was there with Kenneth Neve representing the international meeting of vintage enthusiasts. So was Count Lorani. And so were the folks from the Austin 7 camp, still fighting their way out. Secretary Peter Hull is pleased to see us. And we have a look at some of the other races that took place that afternoon in a bit of a pop parade. And the first bloke in the pot puree is Hamish Moffat, who's stalled at the start of the historic seaman. The afternoon we'd seen all sorts of things, even Citroens from the 1930s. And the inevitable phrase are Nash's. It's something to do with the front track being wider. But that's nothing to do with the front track being wider. That's Woodley and the Alvis who's parked himself in a somewhat uh, dramatic position just to frighten the people that follow on. Before the all-comers race, we asked Patrick Lindsay if he was disappointed in the shorter Ulton. Yes, this is a horrible, this is a horrible circuit now. Um, a silly little corner, very narrow, big curves, and really the track has been ruined. It used to be one of the nicest tracks in the country, and the only real road circuit we've got. And I really think the owners have ruined it by taking away those two lovely straights, those long curves, and it's a horrid little circuit now because of that new corner. Where will you now overtake in order to claim the lead in the main race? Well, <laughs> I don't think I'll be doing much overtaking. I don't know. You, like, on the rest of the circuit, there are a few places you can do it. And of course, if you're brave, you can do it under braking. So I expect everybody will be whizzing by me into the corners. The place to be is Old Hall today, I imagine. Old Hall? Um, yes, I think that'll be quite interesting. Certainly, uh, at least you, you can go off the track there and you, you don't get into trouble, but it's still a horrid corner. Horrid corner or not, the circuit was proving quite a test. EAs, ERAs and Maseratis were really hammering it out round this now much shorter circuit. That's uh, Peter Van Rossum who's having quite a lot of drama in the Cooper Bristol. Cottom's found his way up into third place behind the other two Maseratis.
and Neil Bruce seems to be um, photographing from the middle of the track. There's Peter Van Rossum again, really sorting things out, which is more than you can say for the gentleman with the Austin 7 in the paddock, who still seem to be dismantling the front axle this time. And that's another sort of marshal. I think he probably came from Texas. But during the day, the Fraser Nash boys had had their fling in several races. And probably, of all the motor cars, they were the ones that found it uh, most difficult at the new Foster's Bend. I suppose patience is a virtue. At least it kept him out of trouble. Here's Guy Smith, followed by a compatriot. All the chain gang people were really having some bother at this bend. That's Mark Jocelyn there, who's creeping along. Johnson, with everything flapping. Guy Smith, Norris Special. Yes, it's a chain off of Fraser Nash. And no, they haven't quite finished yet. But we have, because that's the end of our visit to Oulton Park for 1975. And just to blow the moths away, no, it's not actually a moth, it's a stamp. What's it doing there? Well, this is in the middle of Leicestershire, and it's the light car section who are holding their driving tests. Alan Cherritt is having the whole thing explained to him by a marshal. Riddles GN with Tony Jones and Rosemary Burke for the Morris Minor. And out of the heat haze comes Phil Diffie in his Humber doing the Wiggle Woggle. There's Tony Jones. His wiggle's nearly as good as his woggle. Rosemary Burke, with a lid down to get a bit of sun in. And a good-looking Austin 7. It's streamlined so that it can go backwards quickly. El Pampero. No, that's the name of the car. The gentleman in it is Arthur Jerry Fisher. Chains clattering, and it went, and it went remarkably well. So too did George Wallace in the Peugeot Farmer's Wagonette. Peter Hull famous for his writings on Alpha, and just as a compliment, the local aero club had laid on a specially marked aeroplane.
the Lancia Theta of Clive Jerry Fisher. The bulletin said that it was the fastest coffee stall on the Victoria Embankment, but it seemed to be shedding doughnuts as it went along. I think that counts as outside help. I'm sure he'll be disqualified. The usual vintage jacking system, you get 12 people to lift it and then you put a brick under. I think they're holding some sort of memorial service around the front there. But there goes El Pampero. And the tests were so complicated that he took the instructions with him. Colin Crabb, who keeps an ace navigator in the dicky seat, is away home after a very successful light car driving test. And so it's away from Leicestershire and through to another country. Yes, Wales. And there's Collings in a most desirable Mercedes, complete with luggage and umbrella. The umbrella is quite an important adjunct to one's kit for the Welsh Rally. Tony Bird in command of the start on the Sunday morning and we tried to get them to pump in time to the music. But you can't win them all. This was the year when everybody decided that a Vauxhall was the right motor car to have, but it looked as if Vauxhalls had gone into production again, making 3098s. Now don't get cross, love, he's doing his best. First of the Vauxhalls away. It was Patrick Marsh. There was just enough glute to make things glutinous enough to stop motor cars, and in some cases to send them sliding backwards. Even if they had twin rear wheels like this very delightful Crosley. There's Hamish, resting again under his Brescia Bugatti. And Collings in the Merc arrives at Hill 1. The starting procedure is pretty dramatic. Decompress, wind away like an early gramophone, compress, and you're away. At least you could see where the mud was coming from with no mud guards. Philip showed great resource by changing a half shaft on his Elvis. Others did more menial tasks. You could get out of Hamish Moffat. We're in Welsh, so I can't tell you what he felt about the whole thing. There's one thing about Hamish, when he decides to leave the parking area, he leaves the parking area. Even if it is Bill Body in a little Fiat that gets carved up. as if some of the hills were downhill which made a difference this year. 
some of them were just sideways. And as usual, the Royal Flying Corps were well in evidence. That's Cecil Bendall, who's collected all those World War I aviators for his 3098. Moffat hammering up the hills, but it was not really to be his day. As we said, whichever way you look at it, it had to be a Vauxhall. John Rowley was using one. Tony Jones had his Vauxhall out. For once the sun shone, although underfoot it was pretty glutinous, and Hamish Moffat decided that he'd better find out if the ridges in the hill were the same width apart as the wheels on his Bugatti. But as he had difficulty at adding more than three together, he was unable to discern the true answer. Bill Boddy then decided to hold an imaginary telephone conversation. And the one thing you can be sure of in vintage events is that everybody will enjoy themselves thoroughly. The enthusiasm is written all over this young lady's face. But it was an enjoyable year. It was a very special year for the Vintage Sports Car Club.